I'm here to talk about urban planning and some of the things that we learned um, since Katrina for the last five years. Most of those things have to do with a different way of thinking about what a city is, mostly having to do with thinking about the city as a system. Rather than thinking about the city as individual parts, a lot of these ideas are ideas that have been explored mostly in other fields during the 20th century, especially in fields of quantum mechanics, for example, where everything, everything is seen as one integral, complete, dynamic system. Even in, in chaos theory, there are, uh, there's a whole study about how everything is connected. And in New Orleans, the whole idea of connecting everything is really what happened at the end of our, all of our planning. Connecting people, connecting structures, connecting processes, and mostly relationships. But most planning has been done in silos, independent silos, people working independently. But one way of looking at the city is to look at the body. And our body is made up of systems. We have arteries that carry blood and nutrients around to all the different parts of our bodies. And we have arteries in the city and veins that carry cars and goods and nutrients around to all the different parts of the city. We also have a central nervous system in our body that carries an electrical impulse that has information embedded in it that tells all of the different parts of our body how to work. And in our cities, we have telecommunications infrastructure systems that carry all that information out uh, into the cities, uh, various parts all the way to our extremities, to, to suburbs, uh, to, to help run the systems and the infrastructure of the cities. But the other thing that we have in our bodies is that we have organs. And all of those organs have to be connected to each other. And when we know what happens if one of our organs fails, and it kind of doesn't matter which one it is, um, you know, if our liver fails, we're just as dead as if our heart fails. And, and our liver and our heart and our kidneys and all of those parts of our body really have to be connected if we want to be healthy. Same is true of cities. In fact, we can think of the city as having six different organs or domains um, of programs, of facilities, and all of those domains are connected. There's a physical domain, which is everything essentially that you can hit with a hammer. Uh, it's a building, it's a, it's a road, it's a bridge. Uh, we have a cultural domain, which is all of our faith-based systems and, our, and, and our, our belief systems that get manifest in different ways through arts and sculpture and music. We have our social service systems, which include all of our health and human services programs and facilities, and all the people and jobs that are connected to all of these things. We have our economic systems, and our economic systems are not just about financial capital, they're also about environmental capital, and they're about human capital. In fact, if we expend any one of those kinds of capital in the wrong way, it impacts all the rest of them. The BP incident is a good example of how you can't really afford to waste environmental capital because eventually it's, it's going to have financial implications and human implications. The same is true of our organizational infrastructure, where uh, its organizational infrastructure can, can be thought of as, as everything from two people to a, to a garden club or a Mardi Gras crew or a political party. It's where people, uh, where people come together to make things happen, to, to plan some event or to organize a, uh, or, to, or to implement some kind of purpose. And the educational domain is a domain that includes everything from the day we're born until the day we die. It's not grammar school, it's not middle school, it's not high school, it's not workforce training, it's not universities. It's all of those things, lifelong learning, 
all the way from the beginning to the end, and how all of those things are connected together. And that's the most important part of this systemic model of thinking about cities, is that all of these parts are connected to each other, inextricably connected to each other, just like all of those parts of our body. And we can't have any one of those things fail, because when one of those things fail, the whole system falls apart. If we imagine how this would look at a neighborhood scale, then we can see in our neighborhoods that we could have schools connected to health clinics, connected to healthy gardens, connected to healthy grocery stores, uh, connected to all kind of in a central location. Um, if we can consolidate some of these resources, first of all, we make it more convenient. We also make it more economical. Uh, and, and, and we also make it just more efficient. And this is kind of an old idea, but, but we've gotten away from it because in planning we've been thinking about all those parts as independent of each other and not connected to each other. So if we think about this model of, of a nexus of where all of these things come together and they, and they, and they create their own synergy, a public open space, you know, parks, um, uh, c uh, community gardens. I was just talking to Richard McCarthy about this a little while ago. I was talk talking to Karen DeSalvo about, you know, what about these he community health clinics? Shouldn't they be located, you know, near the schools? <laughs> because that's where the, the parents are, that's where the kids are. What do we get for all this if we do? Well, this is one example in, in, in Providence, Rhode Island of a project uh, where it's a very community-driven project. It's got schools, it's got a, a fitness center, it's got a, a, a black box theater, it's got a video production facility. It's very attractive for kids um, and their parents, and this whole process was developed with quite a lot of community engagement, and the result is about a 94% graduation rate. Well, in most cases, graduation rates are, are in the 40 to 50%. <laughs> Right. Um, and what that means nationally um, is, is if we could figure out how to get our graduation rates up, see, we're losing about $148 billion a year because that's what it costs for us to lose a graduate in this country. Another project in Harlem called the Harlem Children's Zone has done a similar kind of thing. It's, 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 a, it's a collection of about 24 community programs, educational programs, all together supporting families. And, and, uh, and the Harvard economist Roland Fryer, uh, who, you know, these guys are not touchy-feely, you know, they're, they're pretty hardcore uh, analyzer, and, and, and uh, Roland Fryer says that this project has done the, the equivalent of, of curing cancer for these kids and eliminating the black-white achievement gap in Harlem. In the Unified New Orleans Plan, the process um, was also about unifying things. There were a number of plans that needed to come together. Um, and and so, so the notion of, 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 of creating a system of plans or unifying the plans and doing it through a unified process, a collaborative process, where all the, the whole community is invited. So the, in, the, in, in this case, there are almost 10,000 people who participated in that process and 12 urban planning firms that took uh, uh, the community through a whole process um, and, and, and even including people who are in, uh, living in the diaspora in Houston, Atlanta, and, and, uh, and, and uh, Baton Rouge. And one of the things that came out loud and clear in that process, um, in fact, uh, about a large majority was that people really wanted their schools to be the center of the community. They wanted the auditorium to be a community uh, a performance center. They wanted the gymnasium to be a community fitness center. They wanted to use the libraries. They didn't want these fortresses with chain link fences around them. They said, we got to get in our schools and we got to use our facilities. We're paying for it. <laughs> Those are our books um, and we need, we need to have, have our schools open 24-7. So when we did the master plan for the schools, first, of course, we needed to look at elevations, uh, flood elevations, but we also looked at building facilities uh, uh, and the condition of those facilities. We also looked at, at, at um, where those facilities were located. So there were 127 sites owned by the Orleans Parish School District. We also looked at point maps where demographers were able to tell us where the children and families were living. So it would make sense to put the schools where people are living or where they're planning to come back. Um, and then when we put all of that together, we came up with, in the case of K-8 to schools, 70 sites. So if we imagine every one of those sites is a nexus, that it's not just a school, 
but it's also a community health clinic, and it's also a farmer's garden, and it's also all of these things that come together to build the synergy that helps people survive and thrive. And given the fact that, that those schools could be located uh, within about a half a mile to three-quarter mile walk of every child and family in the city, that means that now we have the infrastructure in place that when all of these schools are built out, and uh, th then they will, they will be uh, walkable. And if they're walkable, people can walk to them. That means they don't have to drive their cars. So nobody will have to drive their car to get to all of these, these schools. And if the schools become nexus centers, then they won't have to drive their car to get to health clinics, uh, healthy grocery stores, drug stores, all of those things. So we won't have to have automobiles, which means theoretically we don't have to burn fossil fuels it also means that the 29% of our population that can't afford to own an automobile can still have equity. They can have equal access to all these facilities. So it's also less expensive to build it out this way when you can focus your infrastructure improvements in, in these particular locations. So given the $1.8 billion that was just approved two days ago, this is no longer a dream, it's a reality. And in addition to that, uh, Mayor Nagin, um, oh, no, oh, excuse me, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Mayor Nagin didn't do this. Uh, Mayor Landrew is moving in the direction of, of assigning the $1.2 billion that's available for other public infrastructure uh, around these same sites. So the concept of building nexus is now, is, is now uh, ingrained in public policy. Uh, there are all these other uh, collaboratives that are coming together now, as I mentioned about Richard McCarthy and all these other, other uh, we're blessed now with all this self-organizing that's been going on, uh, that we have an opportunity now to build out our city in a way that can be both sustainable, sustainable and equitable and, and uh, synergistic all at the same time. Thank you.